The best source of Star Wars news on the internet in hour of all the things that you love, Star Wars. Today yes. we'll be talking about many subjects including the finale of Rebels and that the Star Wars posters for Han Solo may have been ripped off. Yes. All of this and more. Plus, ah! discussion. And if you're watching this live on YouTube, the last 10 to 20 minutes will be dedicated to answering your live questions. If you're not watching this live, then stick around anyway, because some of those questions are kind of interesting. They're actually and usually then very leave good. leave a comment in the comment section below, and then of course, whatever you're doing, give a like. It yes. doesn't matter, just like the video. It's yes. very important, because Google, It all is right? important <laughs> to me, It is and also important heart. to us. And of course, if, if this is your first time watching Star Wars Hour, and your first time on the Star Wars Network, go ahead and subscribe to the Star Wars Network. It has been found be good for your overall health yes. and education. Also, check out our <laughs> Rebels of Bridge series, which is going very well, and we should have a new episode up up this week. This weekend, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited. Um, so, a little bit on the format. We do, like you said, 10 to 20 minutes at the end for your questions, but feel free to post those questions now, or save them for the very end. We will address them then. If there's a question you really want us to answer, Super Chat. Just because my job is to remind him about Super Chat. Super Chat. So, Rich, with that being said... Do you want to start in with the biggest news of the week? <laughs> sure. There was a different <laughs> fate for Phasma. Oh, just kidding. That's just a little teaser for you guys. We'll get into Rebels later because this dude's going to talk for 35 minutes. He has a <laughs> lot of opinions about that last episode and some good information for you guys. Um, so one of the real interesting bits this week, which we're starting to get those previews that come out um, since it has not released yet, uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi, the at-home version, has all of those deleted scenes that we were talking about last week. Well, one of them has been revealed, and it explains a lot on why Phasma was even in this one at all. She was supposed to play a much bigger role in that Finn-Phasma dynamic. Um, oh, remind me later. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. My computer just said, oh, no. Oh, okay, cool. Just say, yeah. Yeah, Windows 10 update. Okay, cool. Yes. So, um... <laughs> That being said, Phasma and Finn face-off was supposed to be a large turning point for Finn and showing his kind of continual stepping out of the Stormtrooper role into kind of really a legend of Star Wars. Um, the difference was we did not have this real short Phasma bit where she falls into the abyss and dies, which we don't know if that's going to happen yet. We'll see if that ends up shaking out in the wash in episode nine or if they just ignore it and pretend it didn't happen um this one this deleted scene has finn confronting phasma on saving herself instead of the star killer base and then mm. there's this little bit of a uh, uh, friendly quip between phasma and finn about like oh hey like uh, like you're scum and he goes rebel scum so that would have been terrible but at the same time just having that back and forth where finn actually kills phasma finn was the one in this deleted scene to shoot phasma i think would have done more for that story of bringing her back um but that was pretty much it as far as what we know in the deleted scene so far well i mean in the movie he does say i am rebel scum yes whatever. true true he does do that but he does then proceed to kill her right which was a little I, less i think that um according to you know like apparently two hours or something was cut out of this movie and even the deleted scenes that we're going to get including this one i think they're only going to add up to maybe 30 minutes i think they've only given us the best of what was deleted or they're going to give us the best of what was deleted yes. i don't it doesn't it didn't seem like anything really changed uh, with this deleted scene, except for, of course, some some information that vaguely explained a few things. Yeah, I I don't think that any of any nothing that I've seen so far significantly changes. Correct. Anything. Yeah. So people are hoping for that the deleted scene somehow changed the entire plot of the Last Jedi. It doesn't. You know, so, yeah. You know, you just you know, it's still it's still the Last Jedi. So whether you liked it or not, it doesn't. It doesn't change. No, anything. yeah. What ends up coming out of the story is not... Yeah, we have Brandon, a.k.a. And Jack so far. Hello. Also, <laughs> say hi. Feel free when you jump in to say hi. I would absolutely appreciate that. Um, <laughs> that brings us on to our next one, which is my favorite and will probably be a favorite of my buddy Brandon over there, is the team-up between the Star Wars solo film <laughs> and... Yeah, That's if right. you didn't see this coming, you're blind. No offense to the blind. Solo cups. It is Star Wars solo film and solo cups. It seems it seems like a really you know ob it's like the most obvious promotion in yes. in marketing history. Absolutely. Of course, Disney would pay the solo cup company a small 
fee to put the character of Han Solo on their cups while they're trying to promote their movie that is literally called Solo. Solo. It Duh. just it seems like a win-win in the easiest, almost commonsensical I, thing to do. I almost guarantee you that they didn't pay anybody anything. Oh no! Uh, yeah, I, 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 I bet you it was just. <laughs> I bet you it was just one of those things where they were like. Yeah, no, we have to do this. And both marketing teams were like, yeah, yeah, let's just do it. Like, here, yeah. here's some images, and the solo design team was like, okay, here's our product. Because, you know, we'll be buying a lot of solo cups. It's it's guaranteed. <laughs> we'll be having the solo cups on the show. Yes. Like, so that would be good. exclusively what I drink out of if they put the word solo on the cup. Oh, yeah. We will bring that in Well, next I mean, week. it does say solo on the cup. In almost the At exact the font of the movie. Yeah, that's on the, the bottom. That's the yeah, yeah, which is hilarious. Um, so... Just rolling on with the little bits of news here before we get into really the big thing, which is what we teased for all of you, which is the end of Rebels and the poster theft. Uh, Mm. Up next is uh, composer John Williams. He's kind of gone back and forth on this, and Rich can bring up a little more on his history. Um, But he mentions that Episode Nine will be his last Star Wars film that he composes. He's already done this before with composing in general, because the dude's like 91. But... I forget which film he's already done this with. So the thing about the thing about John Williams is he's he's getting to that point in his age in his life where he's always threatening. He's doing the Michael Jordan thing. He's always threatening to retire. He's like, yeah. nope, this is the last one. Like at one point he said that Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was going to be his last movie, but then of course Spielberg was like, no, nah, I need I need you, Johnny. I need you. I need, I need you. you. Yeah, always. I need you. Yeah. And he has, with the exception of one or maybe two films, he has scored every single Steven Spielberg movie. He had scored every single Star Wars movie yeah. and, and the rest of. George Lucas's movies, uh, and uh, it, and it's only now it's like, well, he didn't quite have time to do the spinoff, but like he didn't True. do uh, Solo, and he didn't do Rogue One, uh, and I think that he had, you know, at this point he'd be like, well, I only really have time to do the main Star Wars films, and here's what I think. I think that the reason why he's saying Nine is his last Star Wars movie is because they're probably been like, okay, so Seven, Eight, Nine are like the main films, and yes. it's probably going to be about five or more years before mm-hmm. we jump onto the next trilogy of 10, 11, and 12. Yeah, and if you're going to queue him up and he's 91. Yeah, so yeah. It, he's probably thinking like, okay, I don't know where I'm going to be at in my life, so I'm just going to say that I'm retiring from Star Wars so that if I'm in all likelihood not able to score them, either I'm dead or I'm I just <laughs> too old to want to do it, yeah. Yeah. then I'm like, well, I already said I didn't have to do it. But if he is like still physically able he'll to do it, do it, he'll do. He'll of course do it. But I, yeah. but all he's he's kind of put a safety net for himself, saying that uh, this is going to be my last one. Yeah, so we're going to end on a high note, so that we're not expecting him to come back. Yeah. I would. I th- I'm even like I. He, it's a miracle, I think, that he's doing nine, and I think it's great that he'll be able to close off this sequel trilogy. Yes, but uh, with episode ten. He probably won't do it, but I would hope that, of course, they keep all of his themes. Then you know they will keep all of his themes, or, or they'll I, have them in some iteration. Yeah, like they do. And, and and I and I hope that they'll stay true and not be like, all right, now here's like the techno, the techno, <laughs> like right the dub, the, the dubstep remix. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, Jeez. you know, what's the guy over at DC? Oh, Junkie XL. I hope it's not like yeah. the, the Junkie XL score. I mean, the thing is, I do like techno music, but I don't want techno music in my Star Wars. That's an exaggeration, but I'm just saying I hope that they kind of keep it to the tone of the classical John Williams scores that have been in the past. Well, you, you know the kids don't call it techno music anymore, right? They no. call it they call it electro synth oh. pop hip hop dubstep remix. Sorry, yeah, I didn't know what the young <laughs> the youngest are calling the music these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, well that's it. Do you have anything else on that? Because no. this is we're just we're trying to get featured the little bit that happened over the last week as far as general Star Wars news goes before we take you into the big juicy bits. Big news, and this one's actually kind of fun. Um, because we all knew this happened. We all had a, a hunch that Ryan Johnson scrapped anything J.J. had suggested or recommended <laughs> for episode eight. Well, now it's a little more official. Ryan actually physically scrapped everything that he had pre-written or J.J.'s uh, notes on what oh, he yes. to film uh, to carry him over to nine, which I give Ryan props to for doing as a director because I don't think you should be held to the standards of somebody who refuses to finish anything but 
at the same time for the Star Wars universe, maybe that wasn't the best decision. So there's two big sides to this story, and I think that this is all coming because now we have now the access to a lot of this behind-the-scenes information, I think, via the DVD of Episode 8, yeah. and also interviews that J.J., Ryan Johnson, and Colin Trevorrow have all been doing. So the big thing, of course, is that when J.J. wrote... Um, episode 7, mm -hmm. he also wrote Small Treatments for 8 and 9. And the person that he talked to the most with Episode 8 was Brian Johnson once yep. Brian Johnson got hired. And they had kind of come up with a more complex outline based on J.J.'s outline. So yes. J.J. did his outline, then he worked with Brian Johnson to make a stronger outline. And then once J.J. went off his merry way onto vacation, Johnson was like, heh, 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 and then got rid of all of that and just kind of started over with his own thing. They took the uh, script and he threw it over his shoulder mm -hmm. like Luke did. Oh. I think I think that there's there's pros and cons to this and a lot of you may think that it's all cons. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think the thing is yes, uh you know, Ryan Johnson should have some creative freedom to do the kind of movie that he wants to do. However, this is just my opinion. When you're making something as big as Star Wars, I think you have a responsibility in a franchise this big, you have a responsibility that's bigger yeah. than your own artistic vision, which is, I will say, something that Ryan Johnson doesn't quite even understand. Yeah. And and I think that that's the reason why, again, I liked The Last Jedi. I had a problem with some things, as you guys know. Yeah. But uh, I know that a lot of people had some big issues with it, and I think a lot of that is because Ryan Johnson is, is he, Ryan Johnson is like, he's more in love with the artist Ryan Johnson than he is to maybe staying Star, true yeah, to yeah, the Star, Star Wars, Wars legacy. as a whole. Yeah. It's, um, it's really interesting to just see how he's been um, how he's been working it and what that's causing and what that has caused in the Star Wars universe. I think Ryan Johnson's kind of breakaway, which I'm actually okay with in the long run. I think it'll be pretty good. Ryan Johnson's breakaway from the standard Star Wars script really allows Star Wars to turn into the, just that kind of repetitive space opera thing that I know everybody loves and I love it too. I love it for what it was. But we're kind of getting we're getting pretty sci-fi. We're we're getting true true like classic weird sci-fi stuff, which I'm gonna tie back into our big news at the end with Rebels. Yeah, like, we've been seeing a lot more truly sci-fi things come out in like the Rebels series and now Star Wars the the actual films. So. I, you know, who knows what that original outline was or what J.J. was expecting, but I feel like this is almost, and again, not to just keep dishing on Ryan Johnson, this is almost like karma, I think, for J.J., who took uh, George Lucas's original outline that he gave to Disney and mm -hmm. threw that over his shoulder. So it's like, oh, George Lucas wrote this outline, J.J. threw it over his shoulder, then J.J. Yeah. made his outline, gave it to Ryan Johnson, threw it over his shoulder, and the only person, and this is get, I'm getting into the second big part of this story, the only person that was really willing to play ball with everyone and wanted to get along was Colin Trevorrow yes. and as you guys know Colin Trevorrow was hired to be the director of episode 9 uh -oh. and was recently well it was recently announced to us that he yes. was fired but he actually got fired quite some time ago yeah. because he was having a clash with Ryan Johnson and if you guys don't know the big argument was over Luke in when Colin Trevorrow was the director of episode 9 in his script for episode 9 Luke Skywalker was very much the main character yes. and a big presence throughout so he was like okay Luke is a really important part of my story and at this point this was like two years ago or something Ryan Johnson was like no I kind of want Luke to die at the end of episode 8 and he's like well if you kill off Luke at the end of episode 8 I'm not I, that ruins my I, entire story. I can't do it. Can't you just end yeah. before it shows what happens to Luke? He's like, nah, I don't know. And of course, as we all know, what happened is Ryan Johnson put his foot down. And was like, no, I really need Luke to die. And so they kind of, you know, took it to Kathleen Kennedy. He's like, w can you please say whether Luke dies or not? Because and and she she oh, of course she ultimately de decided to side with Ryan Johnson. Yeah. And Colin Trevero was fired because he was like, okay, well, I I'm, can't do it. If, if I'm not Luke dies, do then that ruins my whole movie. Yeah. So maybe he wasn't fired. Maybe it was. Just a parting of ways. Well, he was officially fired. We know that. So, yeah. he, I well, think he, well, what do you think he did? Do you think he flipped a chair in the room? <laughs> ah, yeah, probably. I'm sick of this. <laughs> you can't do this to me. And like, so, uh, so yeah, that's unfortunate because you know, as I was telling D Rock here before we started, when it was first announced that Ryan Johnson was going to direct eight and Colin Trevorrow was going to direct nine, I was actually more excited for episode nine because mm -hmm. as much as I like uh, Ryan Johnson's previous work from like his 
TV episodes he's directed, like Breaking Bad, in his movie Looper, yeah. Colin Trevorrow with Safety Not Guaranteed and Jurassic World, oh, I really found good. those really enjoyable and i was like oh man episode nine's gonna be fun yes but then i guess he realized when he couldn't make a fun episode nine if luke dies then he was like eh. yep so and then as a and as an ironic twist of fate then now we have jj coming back in to finish the trilogy and who knows what he'll do to kind of maybe yes. he's like oh here's what i wanted to do in eight maybe i can mm -hmm. put some of that in nine who knows but yeah so all of this is on the heels of all this uh news i i bet that some of this kind of came out in the comments commentary for episode eight and some of it's because there's there's a reason why we're getting all this news now as we're getting the dvd and blu-ray release of Is, episode yeah eight. they're having to kind of get ahead of the punch on that commentary because mm -hmm. i guarantee you there's going to be something about that in there there's almost no way there won't be hmm. so you good yeah i guess that's i guess that's it for that do you have anything else on that mm -hmm. no okay <laughs> well that brings us to a story a story of deceit theft and murder and murder? No, 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 there's no murder. But <laughs> as far as we know, <laughs> take a look at this. Take a look. Yeah, bring at up this. those posters. Okay, so this is all the hoopla about this, the posters. This is the hoop poop scoop. Hoop and a poop. Yep. Boom. And look we'll at that. Probably leave this up for a while so you guys funk, can see. Jazz, electronic <laughs> funk and soul. Just kidding. It's about the big controversy, and if you haven't seen it yet. There's not really much more online than what we're going to tell you today. Uh, we've kind of scoured the presses on that. I did some own, my own independent research about this. So what I tell you is what we know. And then what I do after that is all speculation. So the big scandal is the similarity in these two posters right here. This, this is the official Disney release poster Lucas approved... This is, these are your posters. This was the whole advertising campaign yes, for Solo. This was all of it. This is some French dude's art. It was released through, uh, so yeah, a French artist made these for some Sony collections. Yes. It was Sony Music Group ultimately that released, uh, where's my fingers? that released uh -huh. these in 2015 three yes. years ago so sony owns these images on my side disney owns rich these side. images yes. but do you see a problem with these <laughs> images <laughs> don't they, they look awfully similar so long story short yeah. the guy that made these images on twitter was like hey th this is my work like you guys have obviously copied my work i need credit for this and i need to get paid for this you yeah. know and disney's like Oh, so uh, they're looking into it because obviously, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand. It's not like Disney is not like one person. Obviously, Disney is this huge company, and you know, Disney owns Lucasfilm, mm -hmm. and then Lucasfilm owns some stuff. Somebody at Lucasfilm hired a advertising firm to or, take care of this, or stuff. did it internally? But I, they, prob they probably hired it out. Maybe, yeah, could have been mm -hmm. internal. I think it might have been an advertising firm. The point is, somebody, some individual, was ultimately responsible for creating these images. And uh, so Disney's doing an investigation into the artists that made these. Poster and gate. The artists that made these and trying to see if there's yes. any correlation between the two and seeing, like, it was this really theft? Is this just some kind of freaky coincidence? Was it malicious? Or, what? Yeah. or is it, um, what is it? The, not the Ice Ice Baby and. Oh, well, that was, that was planned. I know, yeah. that was Vanilla planned. Ice yeah. taking, is, it, um, is it an accident or is it Vanilla <laughs> Ice stealing under pressure of our decade? We will have to see. <laughs> now, I know a little bit about marketing, the marketing industry and just generally how business productions like this work. If you've ever worked as an artist, which Morning Coffee Run will know, um, you create a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff that might be considered propri proprietary of the marketing company you work for or whatever you probably took with you as like concepts and, and art like that that i mean you made it but it's not yours i have a theory and i haven't been able to find anything on it yet that this french designer either at one point worked for a marketing firm that then I don't think it was direct stealing. I don't think somebody at the marketing firm said, hey, I like this guy's stuff. I'm going to copy it. I think what may have happened was that somebody took this as a reference point or a reference at some point and saved it. And through a chain that could be a different set of hiring and people leaving and coming and going different firms or working at Disney for a bit and then coming back, this ended up happening. This, this fiasco ended up happening. And so I don't think it's malicious. I do think Disney's going to pay out. 
I don't think they're going to oh. be willing to fight it in full. They'll settle out of court for yes, sure. There's like almost, they always do. They are a <laughs> giant conglomerate, and even if that poor artist guy is able to pay for the best attorney in the business, Disney can pay for attorneys for a lot longer. So it'll end up just resolving itself. I don't think we will ever get a true answer to any of this. I think no. that Disney will look into it for a week because, you know, after that, p- bad publicity is really going to start yeah. to see. So they're going to try to figure it out for a week. They'll probably get some answers maybe, but they'll be like, okay, they'll just pay this artist like XYZ no, amount. They'll probably pay him $2 million. I don't think. But meanwhile, no. during the next, I guarantee, like, I saw these at the movie theater just like yesterday mm-hmm. or something. Guarantee you, tomorrow afternoon, they'll be gone. You think Did, they're gonna pull him? You think oh, they're gonna oh, pay him? Absolutely, they're gonna they're gonna pay him and they're gonna pull all these. But what out. are they gonna replace him with? Because, because they people, literally have to have something queued up. People are gonna look at these posters and be like, "Oh, those are those posters." Well, you know, they just go back to what they had before, which is those just the black and yellow ones that say so. Oh, yeah. On it. You think they'll put out a thing that says, "Hey, all movie theaters, if you have these posters, put them up." Oh, absolutely. If you need another yeah. one, order them. I mean, they I just had to do that two days ago for uh, they had to swap out all the May Fourth posters of Avengers. Oh, yeah. with the April twenty seventh one. They. Yeah. Sent movie theaters those within like overnight shipping and yep. it was like, taken care of. Yeah. So I know that if they can do that, they can definitely do this. Yeah, I'm know? sure they'll be able to, but I'm just wondering what'll end up being resolved from that. And I might do a little bit more research in my own time because this stuff interests me. I think I might be able to find some some hidden scoop on who that man is. Now, so. yes, yeah, super controversial opinion from myself. Yeah. I, I really, in my opinion, sadly, I don't think this, you know, this kind of goes back to the Fine Bros thing almost on YouTube, you yeah. know, which I, I fought tooth and nail about a few years ago because I made a couple of reaction videos. And, you know, in case you guys, I'll, I'll sum this up real quick. Basically, Fine Bros were trying to say that they created the modern format of reaction videos and that if you made a reaction video on YouTube, then they were owed 25% of your video's income. And the entire net was like, no. BS. F you guys, you guys BS. suck. Yeah. And they were like getting mad at the even like stuff like the Ellen show when the, she had like kids reacting to like a Game Boy and it was like didn't even resemble anything no, that they had done. They're like, no, we own people it, reacting to things. reacting, yeah. So it's kind of like, think it, this is that. <laughs> it kind of goes back to that. It's like, these are, uh, this is obviously different because this is like art you can physically see that looks extremely similar to each other. Yeah. But at the same time, I still kind of feel that way where it's, if you create something, I mean, th- this isn't the first time that people have put somebody's put like words and an image behind it yeah it goes through with with colors with a color scheme that yeah i mean jackie literally did that exact same thing for uh you know games at night on my other youtube channel like a couple years ago and then might be doing it again for other stuff and it looks very similar to this too and huh. that idea has been done many, many times before this guy ever did it. Yeah. Now, of course, with these exact colors and with that like faded background, yeah. maybe not exactly, but I'm just saying, how? At what point do we say like, uh, you know, you know, people yeah. create similar things all the time, and maybe you shouldn't worry about it because, uh, you know, the world is free, and we need to, you know, not, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is a money play. I don't yeah. think he actually cares. I think he's just like, oh, hey, I should get paid for that. And now it's blowing up. Yeah. I think it's blown out of the water, and I agree with Rich. So uh, Yeah, I'm just saying, like, I think that, you know, you create something cool, maybe you own it for a year, and then, you know, move on or something. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, you ready for the big one? Yeah. This is where you got to take over. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Rebels is done. Yes, this last Monday we had an hour and a half of Rebels episodes. That's damn near a movie. Yeah, and it was pretty awesome. I have I have a few. Well, let's okay. I'll admit it. I have it more than a lot. few ideas. So I know that you, you know if anybody who likes Rebels, you know, you know if you like Star Wars, you probably like Star Wars Rebels. Yes, and you've probably already seen the episode and watched like Collider's review oh, on yeah, it. Good yeah, point. yeah, yeah. So I'm not going to go specifics into what happens in the episode. I'll just kind of give my opinions on on, on things overall. So much spoilers. Yeah. Even oh, spoilers. Even, spoilers. Spoilers. Oh my god. Even even if we don't go into specifics, even if we don't delve into the nitty gritty about what ends up happening at a specific time on this quick recap of Rebels, holy bananas! If you haven't watched it yet, sit, bookmark this video. Watch it after you finish Rebels. Yeah. Okay. If you don't plan on watching it. Which then it doesn't matter, you can just listen to me. So I will just say that 95% of these episodes was just the ghost crew, the characters of Rebels, Mm -hmm. defending lawful against the Empire. That's kind of what the entire show was was all about. Help our friends who have not seen Rebels, much like me, who hasn't finished it. Who's on the ghost crew? Okay, 
So the ghost crew is the main character, Ezra Bridger, Zeb, like the cool blue looking alien guy, yes. Hera Sandula, who's the captain of, of the ghost. Green hair. She's, green. she's the green tendrils. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know. Uh, is Chopper still around? Chopper's still around. But he's the astromech droid. And then Sabine, everyone's favorite Mandalorian yeah. character. Uh, everyone's favorite character on, on Rebels, probably. Yeah. Kanan died several episodes ago. So he, he's been gone. Yep. But. Anyway, so yeah, the and Lothal, by the way, in the very, very, very first episode of Star Wars Rebels, we are we are introduced to the planet Lothal. That's where Ezra's born. That's where mm-hmm. he was raised. Uh, at, well, the, he, he's a street rat, so I don't know if raised is the right word, right. but that's where they find him. Street and rat. throughout the series, they keep kind of going back to Lothal. Yeah. And almost the entire fourth season, really, was on Lothal, just mm-hmm. kind of defending Lothal against the Empire. And, of course, Thrawn, who has been the big bad for the last couple of seasons. Who's Thrawn? So, so Thrawn again uh, was is a creation of Timothy Zahn from the eighties and the nine mm-hmm. the nineties books the Thrawn trilogy which before seven eight nine that was the sequel trilogy awesome um, guy. and he is the Grand Admiral he is basically second you know at, at this point he's pretty much more powerful than Tarkin even yeah he he's the big bad he doesn't have the force he's just an incredible tactician Ruthless. an evil mastermind and a fantastic manipulator yes he's evil 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 evil. Um, Mm -hmm. anyways, yeah, so I, again, I don't want to go into huge specifics because, you know, hopefully you guys kind of have some general understanding of these things. Now you should. (laughs) So, yeah, so 95% of this episode was just the ghost crew fighting Mm -hmm. Thrawn and the Empire and and was pretty self-contained. It's like, uh, not really going outside of that to reach other places of the Star Wars universe, just kind of ending the story of Star Wars Rebels. So what I'm really going to be talking about is that last five minutes, which is the epilogue. Yes. What happens is... Before the epilogue, Ezra uses the space whales, you know, for, you know, I, I they're the Pugils. I can't, I don't know how to say their yeah. name, but they're basically this, this ancient race of aliens that look kind of like our whales. They live in space. They have huge squid-like tentacles, though, and they are a species that can naturally mm-hmm. go into, into, you know, warp speed, hyperspace. Which is where I'm going to jump in for a minute. This is what makes me excited. This uh-huh. In conjunction with the things we see in um, in The Last Jedi and stuff like that, with Ryan Johnson and all these directors kind of moving away from that standard space opera, is the sci-fi we've been waiting for. We are going to get some crazy cool stuff. Yeah. Continue. Space Perhaps. whales. Anyways, yeah, so space whales. So, so Ezra, you know, uses the space whales. They come and they wrap their tentacles around Thrawn, trapping him. But they, they kind of, they break the... Um, the, the cockpit of the Star Destroyer that they're on. Uh, and as I predict, Center. I think I even mentioned this last week in my predictions that it was going to end with Ezra and Thrawn kind of doing a standoff kind of thing. But, he, you know, Thrawn doesn't have the Force, so, you know, it was more of a battle of minds. Mm-hmm. The Space Will grabs Thrawn, trapping him, and then Ezra is using all of his Force powers to kind of contain everything that's happening until the Space Whales go into hyperspace and they get launched into space and we don't know what happens to them. Mm-hmm. Although I'll just jump ahead and say that Dave Filoni, the creator of Clone Wars and Rebels, has said that both Ezra and Thrawn survived this hyper jump. So where did he say that? Where was this where did that news come out? That was like right after the episode premiered. Okay. Did it was did he say that to an audience or how did yeah, it like so a, a lot after? of press like you know you guys know like Christian Harloff from uh, Collider's Jedi Council and a lot mm-hmm. of the big Star Wars press and a lot of press in general were watching this in the theater over at, at Lucas Ranch yes. you know in Marine County. As they do. And, um, you know, Dave Filoni, like, he showed them the episode on the big screen, and then he did a and a afterwards, and yes. one of the things he addressed was that, uh, yes, they get lost in space, and yes, they both lived. Where exactly in space they are, he's not going to say, because that's obviously being saved for the next show. Yes, which was the big... Which is funny that uh, that was released so soon after the original or after the airing of Rebels. I think he was trying to get way ahead of any of the arguments online um, because it really left it up to the imagination on did they live, did they die. And, and I think you're about to take us into a little bit about what happens in the episode after that. Like, right, what, that's what I'm going to say now. Great. All, all of that is just preface from what I'm really getting to because what happens is once Ezra and Thrawn leave and Lothal is saved from the Empire... Uh, Sabine and the rest of the Ghost crew stay yeah. on Lothal for six years, uh, basically while the Empire is fighting the Skywalkers and everything. And, you know, then it goes into the epilogue. I'm calling it the epilogue. They don't really officially call it the epilogue, but that's what it is because yeah. we have a six-year jump. And, you know, so when Ezra and Thrawn get 
you know, taken into space by the whales. That's right before Rogue One. And then it jumps to after Return of the Jedi, and Sabine is kind of explaining, well, yeah, we fought on Scarif in, mm-hmm. you know, during Rogue One, and we, we fought in the Battle of Endor, and we helped the, the Rebel Alliance, but I've been sticking around here on Lothal because that's what Ezra yes. told me to do. And then she's like, well, wait a minute. Ezra said this and this, and I think I misunderstood. I think I know what he really wants me to do. He wants me to look for him. And that's the episode vaguely tells us that Sabine does truly believe that Ezra is still alive and that it's now now that the Empire, as far as she knows, because it's after, again, the epilogue is after Return of the Jedi, the Empire is destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now that she doesn't have to babysit Lothal anymore, she's going to go on a journey to find Ezra. And that kind of takes us into the cliffhanger of this finale. I know it's a finale, but it ends on a cliffhanger because Filoni is really saying, this is what I want to do next. This is my next show. And it's going to be Sabine's search for Ezra because he's still alive somewhere in space. Yes. Um, and so well, there's a lot of things we see in this damn epilogue, uh, you know, other than just kind of confirming that, you know, like Hera and, uh, you know, Rex and everybody were fighting in Return of the Jedi. Uh, we see Hera has a child, a six year old child, mm-hmm. because apparently her and Kanan got it on at some point Ooh. before he died. Even though right before he died, they finally admitted to each other that they loved each other. And it's like, when did they have time? I guess they were just bored in a cave on Lawful one night. Hey, <laughs> hey, what happens in the cave stays in the cave. I don't know. It's it's really unclear yeah. how that happened, but Kanan and Hera had a son, and uh, I think his name was, was they called him Jason Sindula. So Jason Sindula is the son of Kanan and Hera Sindula. He's a six year old child at this point, six years you know, mm-hmm. right after Return of the Jedi. Um, so there's there's one big thing I want to address. So obviously, Filoni is setting up a big Sabine show where she's looking for Ezra, and yes. and, and assuming that the show does happen. She won't find Ezra until like five seasons in, guaranteed. No. It's going to focus on Sabine. We do see uh, just a f- just a couple frames of Ahsoka, and I want to address that because mm-hmm. this is what people are like really freaking out about. So in la- last week during the whole time travel episode, we saw Ezra pull uh, Ahsoka out of the time portal. Mm-hmm. She talked to him for like a minute, and then she jumped back in after her fight with Vader, and she was back on that planet. I can't remember what the name of the planet is at the moment, but she was back two years before that time. Yes. Time travel's confusing, guys. So basically, I think that she saw what the ghost crew was doing over here and was like, I'm going to stay out of this. But that means essentially from that time until the time of this For epilogue, eight years. that's eight years where we don't know what happened to Ahsoka. Yeah. They're going to have to address that at some point. She's been doing some Luke Skywalker hiding on a mountain stuff. Yeah, because when she shows up in front of Sabine, she's got like a sage robe yep. on and she's got a big staff. Boom, she doesn't say anything, but it's like, whoa, what has been going on with Ahsoka for eight years? We're going to get an explanation, whether that be novel, comic, or a completely separate show. I don't think that they're going to do that in a show because I do believe the next show is going to focus on Sabine. Yeah. But we're going to get some kind of media that explains what Ahsoka was doing for eight years, why she looks like a sage, why she wasn't present during the Battle of Endor or any of that stuff from the original trilogy. They've kind of conveniently now explained what Ezra was doing. He was lost in space. Yep. So Yeah. (laughs) That was was the big... uh, That was the big... He's somewhere in space. Yeah. Mike, you ready for my crazy thing? Okay, go ahead. Is that um, Ezra did some force... This is how they'll do an intro, right? Ed, the way they bring Ezra back is Ezra does some crazy force call-out thing, and then Ahsoka picks up on it. Ahsoka finds him. That's my call. I'm making that call now. Mark this date and time. There's almost no way they'll just bring him back magically because he's stuck. If he Because he survives. But he's stuck, and they warped to somewhere, and clearly the drives are down, and the ship was destroyed. He's not going to just be able to, like, pot off of that thing. Maybe they jumped into space somewhere where there's atmosphere, because Filoni also confirmed that Thrawn lives too. And again, Thrawn doesn't have the Force. Yeah. So they had to have jumped somewhere where there's atmosphere. Maybe the space wheels were protecting them somehow. I don't know. I think he has a pretty good idea, but we're not going to find out until no. much later, much later. Or maybe not that much later at all. Yeah. I feel like the next animated show is going to get a trailer like at this year's uh, whatever the big... I can't remember what conventions are going on this year. I was going to say E3, but that wouldn't be appropriate. That's no. a video game convention. Uh, and they already did the Disney convention, so I don't know. I'm sure it will I get... don't think it'll be at a convention. I think it'll be before uh, episode 9. Now, which is 2019, right? 
Yes. That'll be when we get the trailer. Do you think that we are getting a Star Wars animated show before the year's over? No. 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 They're going to take a break. The reason they're taking a break, and this is where the finance portion of it comes in, is because they need to get their Disney network up, and that's going to be a flagship on the Disney network. Right. So you're kind of with me that you think the next animated show is going to be exclusive to the streaming network. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. Because it has to be, because they set up this big ending with a lot of missing parts and all of this, like, canon that you don't see in any of the films that draws a lot of super fans in. And they don't want to put that out on like Hulu or Netflix because they're starting their own service. A lot, a bit, one of the biggest complaints about Star Wars Rebels is that it's a little bit more immature than the Clone Wars show was. The Clone Wars show, remember, the Clone Wars show was produced, of course, before Disney bought Star Wars, yes. and that show was on uh, Cartoon Network. Mm-hmm. And Cartoon Network uh, has a little bit more leeway for mature themes. Yes. Now you still saw stormtroopers dying on Rebels. You saw some violence on Rebels, but it couldn't quite go to where Clone Wars yeah, was. Clone Wars was a lot darker. So I think that Disney finally recognizes that Star Wars is just a little bit more mature. Than and they even can make it. So I think that they want to get away from Disney XD, and they, yeah, that's, that's why they their do want streaming wanting, service. Yeah, they want to be putting it on their streaming service yes. where it's an animated show that can be for adults also. Yes. Yeah, it's going to have to be because if you want to get any inter- if you want to get any play with the more mature themes that have been coming out in the Star Wars cinematography, um, you're going to need to really open up the doors for the writers mm. on like Rebels. Right. So, um, and I think at some point we'll end up seeing that uh, live action bit, right? You talked about that. That that yeah, the, being something coming the, out. At least as of now, they're still planning a big live action show. Yep. We haven't had an update on that in no, a while. No, but, we haven't. But hopefully, we'll hear something. I think we're gonna get a lot of good and new Star Wars content. This se- you're okay. So here's my call, right? Timeline. I think sometime at the end of this year, you will hear that Disney's launch date for their new their new. Uh, streaming service their new exclusive streaming service in that they will already have the first season of this rebel show queued up it will drop it will drop with or not the rebel show whatever they end up calling it but the rebels new spinoff for the continuation it will end up being released and dropping at the same time i think we, we will see it all in one fell swoop because that you're going to get a lot of people subscribing to it i will i'm gonna so- have to I have two. I, I I'm, I'm battling in my brain about this because on one hand, I would have really liked to have them just wrapped up everything in that last episode. I yeah. would have like I would have liked them to be, tie a big old bow. Right. I would have. I think in my. I think if I'm being honest with myself, I would have really liked for a definitive death for Ezra and just be like, "Hey guys, this is what's going on." Uh, you know, I, I actually. Yeah. probably in my heart of hearts would have preferred if Ahsoka died too. I just want them to tie all this up because I think that uh, Filoni was robbed of having a finale on Clone Wars and I really thought, yeah. okay, this is his opportunity to have a big grand finale for everything he's ever done. Nah. But apparently he's like, nope, I've got more ideas, I, which is great. Yeah. I guess I was just kind of looking forward to an ending. As time goes on and he does the, the next show, I'm sure I'll be like, yeah, I'm really glad they ended Rebels the way that they ended it. But right now I kind of have like finale remorse where yes. I just... I really really wanted a more finale finale you know but it's okay i'm glad that they're they're moving ahead i just i just wish we had i guess you know at this point i'd only be complaining because i just want to see more so, yes so well um, i think i think one of the things that you're running into and which is what i'm having a problem too is i don't know ooh, they keep pushing the timelines right so they keep pushing the timelines of this rebel series they keep pushing the timelines from the clone series they and these are true like separate they're almost separate events they they tie in a little bit of stuff from outside like you have vader and stuff like that which is cool but when you have those like iconic characters that are human it's gonna be kind of odd or kind of jarring to like then bring ezra into episode 10 like that would be i don't think that they will but how are they going to wrap up this timeline if they're already so far into the current canon? They're, they are pushing the limit well, on that. That's Okay, well, that's going to bring me into my last big point here, uh, which is, of course, when you have Ahsoka and Ezra and Sabine and all these characters that a lot of fans like myself are really invested in these yes. characters, and we want to see them all tied up together. And I don't think we addressed this last week because this, this hadn't come up in the bigger conversation yet, mm-hmm. but... Uh, Star Wars, you know, they, you know, since they deleted Legends completely and started the new canon as of, you know, 2013, um, they have done 
kind of a poor job of incorporating the expanded universe into the movies, really. Yes, yes, they because have. Uh, uh, so much of the comics and mo- like ninety eight percent of Rebels have not been addressed in any of the actual live action movies. Yeah, and this is supposed to be a universe that is now all connected. That's why they dumped so much of the other canon, supposedly, because yeah, they wanted this all to be a thing. And Kathleen Kennedy said yep. everything's going to be connected. And, uh, you know, again, I, I like to bring up Christian Harloff because he's a respected member of the fan community. And, you know, he has a Star Wars planet officially named after him, Harloff Minor. Uh, he says, you know, he's got his show, Jedi Council on Collider. He says that he wishes that Dave Filoni, who has been the showrunner for Clone Wars and, of course, Rebels and a yes. lot of other things at Lucasfilm, he wishes that he was actually the one in charge over at Lucasfilm. Not to, you know, diss on Kathleen Kennedy or anything, but she has been her entire life a film producer. Yes, and it doesn't. It seems like she's really focused on those those movies, and not so. She's not really thinking of the company and it's the a, brand as a whole. Yeah, it's hard to have your character, your continuity editor, as far as we're concerned. That's that's really what she is. She's making. Sh- she's the canon queen. Well, and funny enough, Pablo Hidalgo is actually head of canon. I get it, but it's end up <laughs> it's end up being this point where. It, it's Kathleen. I mean, these decisions are falling in her lap. She's the one talking about them or not talking about them. And she's really only speaking to the movies because she's a producer and she likes big films. I don't know how much of a Star Wars fan she was before she started all of this. I'm sure she could at least watch them. But I don't know if she was this the person we should have in charge of of the entire universe. I before agree. Uh, she started working at Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy was, of course, best known for being one of the producers on Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. as well as being a producer for many of Spielberg's films. And, um, you know, she wanted to be more than just a single movie producer. So she, and she wanted to get into, uh, you know, leading a production company. Yes. So she started working at Lucasfilm before Disney bought it. And she was the vice president under George Lucas for a few years. Then when Disney bought it, he decided to take off. She became the president of Lucasfilm. Yes. I don't think she was ready to become the president of Lucasfilm. No. And again, I don't hate her as much as so many people do. I, I don't. I wouldn't even say I hate her. I think I think she's been doing an okay and job. I think she's a great businesswoman. But uh, uh, quick pause before you finish your rant on Kathleen Kennedy. It is 15 minutes left, guys. There's 15 minutes left in our Star Wars hours, which means if you have any questions while we wrap up our current topic with another five minutes of discussion, type those questions in and we will send the, save the last 10 minutes for you guys. So, Kathleen, she wasn't ready. She, maybe she wasn't ready to be the president. That's where you were. Okay, yes. So, yeah, I don't know if she was 100% ready to lead Lucasfilm, especially with yes. the responsibility that it has when you need to be in charge of all of these projects because... As Christian Harloff said, when all of the important things in the the last season here of Rebels were coming up, time travel and the finale, Mm -hmm. where's Kathleen Kennedy? She's not talking about it. She's not talking about it, and she's, she's... She's not really acknowledging it. Someone needs to be at the head of Lucasfilm and be like, okay, here's what's going on with this. How does it connect to this Mm -hmm. and everything? And I feel like Filoni has been kind of trying to do that without overstepping his position. Yeah. And it just seems like he... And he's been working under Lucas way longer than Kathleen was. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty much being, uh, you know, kind of groomed for this position. I thought he was going to get it. Uh, I really think that... um, I, I know that he believes it, and I believe it as well. And again, nothing really against mm-hmm. Kathleen Kennedy, but Filoni, Dave Filoni, is the one that should be in charge of Lucasfilm. He knows Star Wars better than anyone else besides George Lucas. And at this point, maybe even more than George Lucas, because he's this is the guy that has been, even within Rebels, he's connected so many things. He brought Thrawn back in. He brought so many things from the past extended universe, made it part of the new universe, because yes. he understands how things connect in Star Wars. Um, you know, and and it would be so great to have him in charge so that in the movies, you're watching like episode nine, and it's like, oh, here's that character from Rebels, or here's that thing from the comic. I'm so glad I read the comic now, because now yes. I feel like I'm fulfilled as a fan that this connected in a significant way because what's going on right now is we're reading these comics and we're getting like Haldo's backstory and then the Haldo we get in episode 8 doesn't feel anything like that character and they don't bring up any of those things from the the comics or books because Kathleen isn't making or or encouraging the directors to make those connections and I have these beloved characters 
just get killed off. And I doubt that Laura Dern even read the the comic and the book that that oh. was a part of. Oh you know? yeah, like, I'm sure she didn't. So it's just, it's just no fault to her. But it, it's a shame that you know this is all supposed to be connected, and they're yeah. not really doing a great job of connecting everything at the moment. And I think what Star Wars is really missing is someone who's in charge that actually gives a damn about connecting the universe. Well, in that I, way. I think part of this comes down to just the way some of these larger companies are usually run. They usually have. Oh, sorry, I hit some buttons. I was going to dump the posters because we're not talking about those anymore. Oh, well, yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> so it was some fun stuff on the screen. Um, I, a lot of these large companies are run by, yeah, you have a lot of opinion and influence from George Lucas, but at the end of the day, you're having board of directors and all these major decision makers. They probably looked at Kathleen Kennedy, and arguably she's done a great job, as a great businesswoman. Like, she's she's done a fantastic job of, like, overall promoting the films and the stuff that's the real money makers. And if you're Lucasfilm and Disney, you're looking to have that investment of Disney picking up your franchise as you need it to pay off. You need it to pay off. And I think she's done an okay job so far. Um, but I think part of the problem is, is they've put her in this position of a catch-all where she's both doing that and helping guide the financial decisions, but also stifling the creative breadth or, or, or connections. She's not allowing for the connections between the directors of or, or the writers of Rebels and everything else. There, there isn't th- mm-hmm. those spinoffs truly just feel like spinoffs. They feel like fan-made stuff. I mean, they're really fun and there's a lot of good stuff in there, but we're not seeing it connected in the larger Star Wars universe. And I think that's causing us as long-term fans to have an issue with the new films. I think that's probably the crux of it. Yeah, there's been some issues and people complain about like politics and stuff like that and why did they do this? And there's some creative decisions there. But at the end of the day, if they would have came in and like introduced Holdo in a way that made us feel something for her, we would have gone back to that more impassioned and I think somebody mentioned it earlier, the space opera. I'm just excited to see more of the sci-fi stuff explored. I don't think they're ever going to go full sci-fi because they can't. I mean, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be Star Wars if it did it. But we're moving away from having the real deep, complex story for these side characters that we used to get by having that interconnection between all the additional canon and all the extended, not the extended universe, but all the external canon outside of the films. I think that Kathleen Kennedy would have done really well as the head of like DreamWorks or New Line Cinema. Yeah. A movie company where... It's very where, linear. Yeah, it's, it's film. Yeah, and she could have focused on many different films. Lucasfilm, let's let's face it, besides the Blue Moon Indiana Jones movie, yeah. you know, <laughs> Lucasfilm is Star Wars. Yeah. And Star Wars is so much bigger than just a movie uh, franchise. It's books. It's comics. It's video games. And to mm-hmm. be in charge of that, you have to be invested in all... All of that. It's like a tree, guys. Mm-hmm. And then that's really, I would argue, is causing some of the issues on these other external stuff, too. I know she doesn't have direct control over a lot of this stuff, but that kind of attitude is spread throughout out the realm of Star Wars creation, and that's how we get these flops like Battlefront. If there would have been more of a connection on story arc, I would have argued EA would have made something more like their like the Mass Effect, like a deeper story. Now Mass Effect had its issues with its with its coding and stuff like that, but at least they would have tried. At least they would have went into something so, deeper. I hate to keep trying to resurrect the dead horse, but if Lucas Arts was still around which yes. was directly connected to Lucasfilm, then I don't think we would have had issues like, oh, communicating with EA because it would have been in-house and it would have been directly connected with the people that make the movies directly involved with the with people the, that are yes. making the games. Yes. And they would have some of those would have been the same people. Instead, Disney licensed it out to EA, and now we have problems. Gee, why? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think it's I think it's funny. This is a silly example, but a, a good way of licensing out a product is really incorporating those original writers, like you said. And my favorite example of that is I don't think I have played a Lego Star Wars, a Lego Harry Potter, a Lego Indiana Jones, where I wasn't like, well, that's the best insert name of franchise here game I've played in the last 10 years. They are... They're not necessarily... Most of them are silly. They have some silly moments in it. But they still feel like that franchise, which is crazy (laughs) because they're working with the original teams. Yeah. So, and props to Lego and and right on. Sorry. That was (laughs) was a bit of a spinoff. But um, as far as the Star Wars info goes, we have two questions, two immediately identifiable questions, and maybe that'll fill the next couple minutes since uh, nothing else is flowing in. And maybe you guys will come up with some more as we continue to discuss. Um... Which we talked about a little bit. Hockey Song said, should Dave Filoni replace Kennedy? 
My answer, no. No, you don't think so. I think Kennedy should stay where she is, and she should allow Filoni to take more control over it. I think removing her from her position would be a very bad decision, because I think she has the ability to have that locus of control that will allow all of the cannons to line up and everybody to stay in line on the, on the Lucas stuff. But the, when, when it comes to those specific decisions on what should be happening, that should go to somebody else. She can control what happens, but what should be happening there needs to be controlled by Dave it, You know, it could also be argued that they should just create a new role that is equal to her. In, like, she's the yes. business side and he's the creative Correct. side. Because right now she's both and she's horrible at the creative well, side. Well, and that's why every company and everything, everything operates with a CFO, somebody who charges all the finances, and the CEO, somebody who runs all of the executive positions. And then they even have COOs and stuff like that for operations. They don't have that right now. They've kind of put Kathleen on this pedestal, which which is really hard. That's a lot of responsibility for her. If I was her, I'd be like, hey, can I delegate some of this? <laughs> um, but that's a really hard position to fill and expect to do everything right. You cannot be good at everything. It's just physically impossible. And she's very good at the business aspect and I do not discount her on anything of that. She is not the best at what uh, we're seeing as far as content goes. Yeah. So, you know, again, we're going to try to answer a couple questions live here, but Hey, if you're not watching this live, go ahead and leave a comment below. Who do you think should be in charge of Lucasfilm? Oh yeah. Should it be Kathleen Kennedy? Should Dave Filoni take over? Throw out some random people, Should they work together? Should Spielberg get involved? Should George Lucas come back? Let us know in the comments section below. We'll accept any answer, and the best answer gets a thumbs up from me, and maybe acknowledgement in the last episode, or the next episode. Who knows? I'll probably comment. But anyways, uh, now we're going to get to some live questions. Unless you had anything else to say. Oh, no, that was, well, that was Hockey Song's question. Oh, that was a question. Okay. You got to listen. How much I was paying attention. Do you see me how I'm rocking the yes. the webcam right there? I know. You're, I'm so impassioned. Ah. Um, so DJ Drop asked, "How do you think they should start connecting everything?" Um, from a operation standpoint, they need to remove Kennedy from that that major position. That's that's where they should start. To to preface my answer to this question, I say that a lot. Preface because my answers to questions are overly complicated. I think that's the first time you've said that this this stream. Oh, no. I think I said it before. But it, Somebody I, go back, count the number uh, of times he said preface. Preface, preface, preface. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to give you an example of when they took it too far. Right now, Star Wars isn't doing it enough. I'm going to give you an example of when it went too far. In 2003, mm-hmm. they had a video game called Enter the Matrix because oh, the, yeah. the, uh, the, Wachowski, the Wachowski siblings... Ooh. Uh, were uh, they were trying to interconnect everything, and what they did is they had a huge uh, plot that involved Naomi, uh, which was uh, Jaden Smith's, not Jaden Smith, his mom, something Smith. Ah, I can't remember Mrs. Her name. Smith. Mrs. Smith. Her character and her crew, it focused on her character and her crew, yeah. and uh, what ended up happening is in the second, or th- no, it was in the third Matrix movie, we see their crashed ship, which, you know, crashed at the end of the video game, and, and uh, you know, Lawrence Fishburne, you know, Morpheus was like, what happened? She's like, uh, I don't got time to tell you about it right now. And, and if you're just mm-hmm. watching the movies, you're like, wait a minute, what happened? I don't understand, because the last time you saw those characters in the previous movie, they were okay, and then there's this big plot hole, and uh, they kind of reference things during the movie that it's like if you didn't play that game a you don't know how naomi's ship crashed uh or i think her, actually her name was naomi sorry i haven't watched the matrix mm-hmm. trilogy in a while you don't know how her ship crashed you don't know what happened to her crew and you don't know the references that they're making in that movie mm-hmm. so it's like oh well gee i missed that video game so now i'm not appreciating like 25 percent of this movie that's bad that's when it went too far yeah it's like okay you have to play this game to appreciate this movie and a lot of people didn't play enter the matrix i didn't i didn't understand the movies i don't like them even though there was there was tons of other problems with the the matrix sequels yeah that was a glaring issue what i think that star wars can do to do that better is just subtle nods to things because right now we're barely getting anything Uh, we're not getting two seconds of chopper in the background of rogue one and the ghost crew in the middle of scarif yeah is like those are nice little easter eggs but i those aren't those aren't connections we need something a lot more substantial than that without being crucial to the plot if that makes sense. they're getting too cheeky with the easter eggs and thinking that's enough in order to connect all these worlds we should see like if possible we should see characters like Ahsoka or Ezra mm. 
play, like they come in, they're like, hi, I'm Ahsoka Tano, I'm going to help you on this mission. Maybe they help with a mission, yep. or they're in the middle of a battle and they're flying an X-Wing, and they're, they, they're fun, and it's like, if you're a fan of those characters from the cartoon, you'd be like, yeah, that's so cool, and they had dialogue, and they had interaction, yeah, and they, they did pop, things. Or they pop up on the comms. But not to the point where if you didn't watch that cartoon, you won't know what's going on. Like, yes. Ezra's story wouldn't be crucial to what he's mm-hmm. doing in the movie, but if you know Ezra, then you appreciate what he's doing in the movie that much more, because you understand his character from the cartoon but he's still if you've never seen rebels before you would watch ezra in xyz movie and you would appreciate his character as a standalone yeah so if that makes any sense to you guys then you know what i'm talking about okay we have two more <laughs> questions in a minute and a half so morning coffee run asks if you had the ability to change or alter one of the star wars movies which movie would you change and what would you change um oh you know, any of the star wars movies yeah <sighs> that's a really tough question, guys. I would change in the... I would do all of the prequels over again. I know a lot of people give the prequels crap, and I think they were a symptom of the time uh, when they were released. That was just the way the dialogue was done. was was kind of just how movies were going at the time. I would revamp the dialogue to be more realistic, less serious. Well, I, we can I, have, would, um, I would do a sweeping one. Just do just do one real quick, and then we someday we'll have an entire discussion yes. on the on the prequel trilogy. Yes, Again, I like the prequels too. I'm not yeah. a prequel hater at all. I love all. But Star that would Wars. be what I would change because when you watch it now, it feels so disconnected. It, it there and there's a. I would love to because I have this fantastic answer for the dialogue in the Star Wars prequels. So I just don't have time to get into it. That at is the moment. okay. <laughs> so would that be something you would change too? And can we go to hockey songs question before we run out of time? Would I change it? Maybe, but that's not okay. the number one thing I would change in Star Wars. I would the number one thing I would change is actually oh, it's too complicated. We're gonna move on. Okay, we'll talk about the prequels. That's a really good question. Jeez. I appreciate that. Uh, last question from Hockey Song, and then we are done because it has been an hour. Yeah. Um, do you think Peter Jackson should have been one of the directors for the sequel trilogy? If yes, which episode? To me, I say he should have done episode seven. I think the only thing that Peter Jackson ever cared about was the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yep. Have you seen his movies before Lord of the Rings? No. Like, Frighteners is fun, and, uh, oh. you know, Dead Alive is kind of kooky and weird. But those aren't great movies. Lord, he was just in love with Lord of the Rings and New Line, which was going bankrupt at the time, mm-hmm. gave him all of the money they had left because they're like, well, we're either going to go bankrupt and 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 lose everything, or we can make these awesome, like, and gamble everything on these Lord of the Rings movies. And they won, and it paid off. But yeah, you know, he was super passionate about it. Mm-hmm. The studio was behind him. Everybody was riding on those movies, and they were great. But it, he didn't really care that much about King Kong, and in my opinion, that King Kong movie yeah, wasn't was, very it was good, bad. and it's already been remade, and yeah. then uh, re- rebooted, I should say, because Skull as Island's a, very different. Or always will be. Uh, I didn't care for the Lovely Bones, and I didn't care for the Hobbit trilogy, yeah. so I feel like Peter Jackson was kind of, for lack of a better term, and apologies to him, he was kind of a one-trick pony. Uh, side note to that, Peter Jackson, I agree with that, he shouldn't a have done it. A one-trick pan- prancing the, pony. Yes. Um, <laughs> the What they did... In the same style of like Peter Jackson having a Lord of the Rings kind of a medieval darker uh, director, somebody with some experience with that, they brought on the Game of Thrones guys, which is more to see, and we'll see what ends up happening with that as it moves forward. Mm-hmm. So, but I think with that, that that's an hour. We hit an hour, my friends. We did it, and we did it with the help of you guys and passioning us and our love of Star Wars. Oh, I, I, it's, uh, it's crazy because I always feel like I have so much more to say. We could yes, do. He does. I, I wish we had the Star Wars six hours. <laughs> that we get exhausted, but I could do it. Oh no! <laughs> oh, he could no, do it. No, no. He could do it. That's called when we hang out, and I enjoy every minute <laughs> of it. Um, but for you guys, this is just a bite-sized portion of what happened this week. We had some Phasma news. We had some solo news. We had uh, John Williams news. We had Ryan Johnson news. We had a poster theft, and of course, Rebels. Thank you guys all for watching. Go ahead and leave a comment in the below on anything you oh, would like. Oh, super important. Yeah. Leave a comment below if you would like us to just do a separate upload one of these days oh, sure. of just, uh, just us discussing our thoughts on the prequel trilogy. Because I know that's not really oh, yeah. news, and that doesn't really feel like it belongs in Star Wars Hour, but if you would like us to have like a big, like, just a discussion about uh, the prequels, and I don't think it'll be live. It'll just be like our thoughts as a video. Yes. Would you like us to do that? I think we're going to do it because I want to do it, but yeah. would you like us to do it anyway? i got to rewatch it. Comment, hit that like button, subscribe, 
right here to the Star Wars Network. And stay tuned for the next Rebels of Bridge, which oh, yes. will be out later this week. And probably hope, Saturday. Yes, probably Saturday or Friday if I can convince Rich. <laughs> We're busy tomorrow, though. Um, so with that, you guys, we wish you all a wonderful <laughs> evening. Bye-bye. Bye.